Okay, so I'm going to be talking about statistical. Oh, okay, sorry, it just told me it's being recorded. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about statistical criteria of algorithmic fairness and the plan for the talk. Um, get going. Okay, there we go. Um, the plan is to start off with a brief overview of some issues in algorithmic fairness, just a very brief taster uh, for those of you who might be unfamiliar with this area. Uh, and next, I'm going to describe the kind of predictive algorithm that I'm going to be focusing on, just to regiment discussion a little bit. Uh, next, I'm going to get to the heart of the talk. Uh, I'll survey some proposed statistical criteria of algorithmic fairness, uh, along with some impossibility theorems that have gotten a lot of attention that show that these criteria aren't jointly satisfiable, except in marginal cases like where the prediction is perfect or where base rates of the relevant property are equal across groups. So for example, that each racial group has the same base rate of crime or defaulting on a loan or what have you. And then we face a question of how to respond to these impossibility theorems. Uh, should we say, uh, take a pessimistic response and say that this shows that there are inevitable fairness dilemmas that we can't help but be unfair to certain groups in certain ways, no matter what we do? Or should we take a more optimistic uh, approach or response and say, these impossibility theorems show that not all of these statistical criteria are genuine fairness criteria. Not all of them are necessary for fairness. And then the question arises, which ones are genuine necessary conditions on fairness and which are specious? Um, next, I'm gonna, then this is the real heart of the talk, I'll present a simple case in which I think a perfectly fair algorithm can violate all but one of these criteria, thus showing that that's the only one left standing as a plausible necessary condition on fairness. Uh, and moreover, and interestingly, this perfectly fair algorithm can violate all these criteria simultaneously, and it can do so even when base rates are equal across the relevant groups. So I think the, the issue of equal base rates or unequal base rates is not a total red herring, but, but you know, I think you can, you, you can want to violate some of these criteria even when base rates are equal across groups. Okay, so, uh, and then I'll close with some general reflections on algorithmic fairness. Okay, so a few uh, instances of, uh, high profile instances of what would seem to be algorithmic bias or unfairness. Uh, so algorithms for facial recognition software were found to be less accurate for women and African Americans. Uh, that seems problematic at the least and perhaps biased or unfair. Um, a Google ad algorithm was less likely to show ads relating to high paying jobs to, to, to women than to men. Again, that seems problematic, perhaps biased and unfair. Uh, Google Translate translated neutral non-English pronouns into masculine English pronouns in sentences concerning stereotypical stereotypically male professions like being a doctor or a lawyer. Uh, again, seems, seems unfair or perhaps biased. Uh, I, there's a nice quote from uh, Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, uh, which I think sums up something of a consensus view, saying that uh, algorithms are, are still made by human beings and those algorithms are still uh, pegged to basic human assumptions. They're just automated assumptions. And if you don't fix the bias, you're just automating the bias. In response, there was a snarky uh, tweet from a conservative writer for the Daily uh, Wire who said, uh, socialist rep uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez claims that algorithms which are driven by math are racist. The idea is they're just math. They can't be uh, racist or otherwise biased. Um, I think that's clearly a mistake. I mean, it's true that algorithms don't, presumably they're not self-aware at this point and they don't have consciousness, so they don't have inner feelings of prejudice or hatred, uh, but that doesn't mean that they can't be biased in, in other ways. Uh, but even though I think uh, AOC was broadly right and this writer Saavedra was broadly wrong, uh, it's still difficult to determine in particular cases whether a given algorithm uh, is biased or unfair, and that's due in large part to a lack of agreed upon criteria of algorithmic fairness. Um, and this can be seen in what I think is far and away the most famous case study in algorithmic fairness. Uh, it's so famous that the computer scientist who works on these issues, uh, Arvind uh, Narayanan, who many, some of you might know, he's at Princeton, uh, he says it's basically obligatory, uh, mandatory to mention uh, this algorithm in any discussion of fairness in machine learning or algorithmic fairness. 
and that is the uh, algorithm of Compass. So this is a uh, an algorithm used to predict recidivism, and it's supposed to be for purposes of making certain decisions about bail or parole or uh, alternative, um, I guess, alternative treatments, alternatives to to imprisonment. Um, and in a major report for ProPublica, and this is kind of like the the ur text of algorithmic fairness stuff, I take it. Uh, these authors, Julie Anglin, Jeff Larson, uh, Surya Matu, and Lauren uh, Kirshner, argued that Compass is, quote, biased against Blacks. And that's, that's uh, their quote from, from their, uh, the headline of their piece. Um, and the reason they said that it's biased against Blacks is that uh, Compass yielded in their, in their analysis of, of its results, uh, yielded a higher false positive rate for Blacks than for Whites. What that means is uh, there are a higher percentage of those who uh, were labeled um, high risk but then didn't commit a crime. That, that rate was higher for blacks than for whites. Uh, and it also yielded a higher false negative rate for whites than for blacks. So uh, the percentage of people who were uh, labeled or predicted not to recidivate or commit a crime, but who then did, that was higher for whites than for blacks. So this seems problematic. I mean, it seems as though maybe the, the algorithm is sort of um, being very, very risk averse when it comes to uh, black defendants, right? Wanting to err on the side of caution, where caution means kind of uh, um, predicting that they will commit a crime. You know, you don't want to get that wrong, right? Um, but then for for whites taking the opposite approach and and uh, being um, less ready to predict that they would recidivate or commit a crime, right? So that seems biased offhand, but that's not the end of the story. Uh, North Point, uh, now it's Equivant, uh, that was the company behind Compass, they rebutted this charge of bias and uh, their analysis, I mean, they have a lot of things that they say in their analysis, some taking issue with how uh, the ProPublica authors calculated their false positive and false negative rates uh, and some other things, but one of the key elements of their rebuttal was their claim that Compass was equally accurate for blacks and for whites in a technical sense, which I'm not really gonna, um, get into of equal areas under the ROC curve. So the, some sense of equal accuracy for the two groups. And in an independent study, so not associated with the company, uh, some authors, Flores and, and co-authors, they also rebutted this charge of bias and they said that Compass was equally calibrated for each group in the sense that for each particular risk score, so Compass used a sort of uh, one through 10, or I think it was zero through 10, uh, uh, risk score, uh, for each possible risk score, the percentage of black individuals who were assigned that risk score and then went on to recidivate was about the same as the percentage of whites who were assigned that risk score who then went on to recidivate. So the idea is, you know, take risk score seven, right? The percentage of black defendants who were assigned risk score seven who then went on to, to commit a crime was about the same as the percentage of uh, white defendants who were assigned risk score seven, who then went on to recidivate, and so on for all of the other uh, risk scores. So that's a sense of kind of equal accuracy. Okay, so it seems as though uh, ProPublica, the ProPublica authors, were tying fairness to one set of criteria, while their opponents, uh, the company itself, and then Flores and co-authors, were tying fairness to a different set of criteria. So ProPublica relied on the claim that fairness requires equal false positive uh, rates across groups and also equal false negative rates across groups. Uh, North Point, the company held that fairness requires equal accuracy in the sense of equal areas under the ROC curve. Um, and Flores and co-authors uh, held that fairness requires calibration within groups. Okay. Uh, but so which criteria are in fact necessary for an algorithm to be fair or unfair? This is still unsettled. We've just got a bunch of competing claims. Uh, you know, Compass seems like it, it violates some intuitively attractive criteria, satisfies certain other ones. Uh, so what do we say at the end of the day? Okay, a little bit of um, <clears throat> ground clearing. Uh, so I think unfairness and bias uh, perhaps come in many different forms and flavors. Uh, so I'm going to, and, and this might be sort of um, putting my thumb on the scale a little bit, I'll, I'll see what people think in, in Q&A. Uh, 
Uh, I'm going to focus not on whether an algorithm is unfair to individuals or on whether it's unfair to groups, but rather on whether it's unfair to individuals in virtue of their membership in certain groups. So I think that that's the kind of core idea of unfairness or bias that people are getting at. Although I'd be interested to hear if people think that's mistaken and uh, really there's another notion of unfairness that's, that's at play here. Excuse me, could you just clarify what you mean uh, by that exactly? Yeah, so, so I think, um, well, so I think you could be unfair to an individual um, on lots of different grounds, right? So you could just arbitrarily dislike them and be unfair to them in that sense. Um, that wouldn't though be un necessarily unfair to them in virtue of their membership in a certain group. Like if I just take a random disliking to someone, but not, not in virtue of their race or their gender or their religion or their membership in any other kind of salient social group, uh, I would be unfair to them, but not unfair to them in virtue of their membership in a certain group. As for unfairness to groups, I think there's, you know, I think it's going to be controversial whether it really makes sense to talk about being unfair to a group as opposed to unfair to the individuals in that group in virtue of their membership in that group. Um, I, I take that to be a bit of an open question, though. Um, but, but yeah, it's not clear. I think talk about group rights, uh, group um, uh, unfairness to groups, uh, wronging, wronging of groups is probably just going to be more controversial. It's a harder, slipperier notion than, uh, you know, harming or being unfair to individuals in virtue of their membership in certain groups. So the idea behind unfairness in virtue of a membership in a social group would be like, if I treat a, um, some given woman worse than some given man, because, you know, uh, whether implicitly or explicitly, it's kind of because of uh, her gender, um, then that's unfair to her in virtue of her membership in a certain group. Yeah. Does okay. that help? Yeah. Her? No, no, yeah. It, it's just, yeah, I was just making clear. It's because. It's a, it's a, it's a statement of because. Yeah, yeah because. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brian, uh, just on that point, um, the because that you had in mind is not necessarily sexological, right? Uh, right. It could be, yeah, I, I, I kind of want to be pretty open-ended here, and I think it won't really matter for my key uh, example. Um, right, it could be a kind of conscious psychological motive, it could be an unconscious motive, or it could be something else, right? It could be, um, I don't know, something to do with societal structures that don't, um, uh, that don't go by way of individual psychological animus. Okay, cool. And a little bit more um, ground clearing. So I'm going to focus on algorithms like Compass that make predictions uh, rather than decisions. Uh, that's going to be somewhat important in what follows, um, uh, I think. But I think it makes sense to start off focusing on algorithms that are predictive algorithms, first and foremost. And these algorithms are going to take as input a set of known features. This is often called a feature vector. So it could be stuff like past criminal history, uh, whether you're employed. I mean, it'll depend on what the predictive algorithm is, is doing, whether it's trying to predict crime or whether you'll pay back a loan or what have you. But it's, it's a set of known features that it takes as input. And then it outputs either a risk score or a binary prediction, you know, yes, no, positive, negative, um, or it might do both. Uh, and for simplicity, I'm going to let the risk score fall in the closed interval zero to one, uh, which we can then kind of think of as uh, an estimated probability that the individual question, uh, the individual in question falls into the positive class, whatever that might be. Maybe positive means uh, you, you will commit a crime or that you will default on the loan. Um, and I'm going to focus on algorithms that output both a risk score in the zero one interval and also a binary prediction of yes or no. And I think this also makes clear that, uh, you know, this, some of this literature is about, you know, seems uh, motivated by recent developments in AI and machine learning and so forth. I think this setup makes clear that the criteria that will follow and the issues of fairness and the relevant impossibility theorems that I'll, I'll uh, sketch later, uh, they apply much more broadly than just these kind of really high tech, uh, deep learning, machine learning, AI uh, kinds of algorithms. And it, indeed, they, they can apply even just to you know, individuals making predictions, right? So if we think of 
me as having some subjective probabilities and also some binary beliefs, then I, I sort of uh, can fit this, um, this framework here. Okay. Uh, criteria of algorithmic fairness then. So, so some criteria of algorithmic fairness uh, might concern what, what I'll call the inner workings of the algorithm. So here's a plausible uh, criterion that I think is widely accepted. Um, the algorithm should be blinded to group membership. So it shouldn't take as input as part of the feature vector uh, what race the individual belongs to or what gender they are or what religion they are. And that might be context sensitive, uh, you know, which which group memberships are, are, are salient and, and we want to blind the algorithm to, but that's the idea. So the feature vector shouldn't include facts about group membership. And plausibly, and this is a really uh, tricky issue, maybe it must, not, uh, must also not include uh, proxies for group membership. It's really difficult to say when something is a proxy for group membership in a problematic sense, but the idea is, you know, for instance, um, uh, um, there's a lot of residential you know, housing kind of de facto segregation in the US. So you can pretty well predict someone's uh, race by looking at their zip code. Um, so if we have the algorithm blinded to race, but it knows zip code, then you've got a kind of proxy for uh, race in there. And that might be problematic. That's a really complicated issue. And it's not really going to matter for what I'm talking about here, though. And, and I also want to flag that some authors uh, push back on this idea that algorithms should be blinded to group membership. So these authors that I've mentioned here, uh, they suggest that in some cases, fairness might be improved by not blinding the algorithm to group membership. Uh, I have some things to say about their arguments. I'm not terribly convinced, but um, that's the idea. Um, another very plausible necessary condition on fairness, again, concerning sort of the inner workings of the algorithm, is that it used the same threshold for each group in moving from a risk score to a binary prediction. So it would be unfair, for example, if uh, uh, black defendants who were assigned risk scores above 0 0.6 were re received the binary prediction that they would recidivate, while whites who were assigned the risk score above 0 0.7 were predicted to recidivate. Clearly unfair, I think. Or at least you'd need, you'd need quite a good justification for, for doing things that way. Right? And there might also be a bunch of other criteria of fairness concerning you know, the intentions of the designers, uh, the uses to which the algorithm is put, the data on which the algorithm is trained for the case where it is a fancy deep learning sort of uh, AI algorithm. Um, these are all criteria of algorithmic fairness that concern what we might call the inner workings of the algorithm. Those are not my concern today. So I'm gonna be focusing on criteria that require certain relations between predictions and actuality to be the same across relevant groups. So these I'm going to call statistical criteria of algorithmic fairness. Some people talk about classification parity or they have other terms for this. I'm just going to talk about statistical criteria. Uh, and these criteria are attractive in part because they don't require us to sort of dig into the inner workings of the algorithm or look at the data on which it's trained, which it was trained. I mean, these, some, in some cases, these are uh, proprietary. It's private companies doing this stuff and they don't let you uh, peek under the hood. Uh, and, and even if they're not, I mean, it can be quite opaque uh, to most people to try to figure out, you know, how this super complicated algorithm is, is really working. So they're attractive because you just, you just, you know, look at what was predicted and what actually happened and, uh, you know, make sure some relations were the same across uh, relevant groups. And that's what the ProPublic authors did, right? Okay, um, and here are a bunch of statistical criteria that have been considered in the literature. Uh, there are surely some plenty that I haven't considered or others that you could devise. And a bit of uh, a quick caveat, don't worry about remembering all the details. Um, what I'm gonna be doing is trying to take them all down, save one using a simple example. So if you don't, if you don't hold in mind exactly what each of these criteria are, or sort of quickly memorize them all, don't worry. Um, or if you can't really see the motivation for some of them, again, don't worry. I'm not gonna be, I'm gonna be attacking them, not defending them, so uh, that's kind of fine. Um, okay, so, so I'll just go through a bunch of them. Uh, I think there are 11 in all. So calibration within groups, right? This is the one that uh, Flores and co-authors uh, uh, talked about and said that Compass satisfies it. So this says that for each possible risk score, 
the percentage of individuals who are assigned that risk score who are actually positive, maybe actually committed a crime, uh, is, should be the same for each relevant group and should be equal to that risk score. So, you know, 0.7, right? Uh, that's 70% uh, of blacks assigned risk score 0.7 should recidivate and same for, for whites. Um, and here's some, I'll just have some citations here, uh, just if people are interested in chasing up some of these uh, criteria of fairness later on. I'm not going to, uh, I'll just try to give a bit of the motivation. So th in this case, it's motivated by the idea that risk scores should mean the same thing for each group or have the same evidentiary value for each group. And stop me for these if, if you want a bit of clarification. Um, uh, incidentally, a modified version of calibration within groups is going to be the sole criterion that I will defend and that isn't um, violated by my perfectly fair algorithm. Okay, equal false positive or false negative rates. So there, there are really two I'm lumping in here. Equal false positive rates just says that the percentage of actually negative individuals who are falsely predicted to be positive should be the same for each relevant group. False, equal false negative rates says the percentage of actually positive Actually, positive individuals who are falsely predicted to be negative should be the same for each relevant group. Uh, so here's a bunch of citations. People have different terms for these things, equal opportunity, equal, equalized odds, error rate balance, and so forth. Uh, I sort of gave the, the, the motivation earlier in talking about Compass. Uh, you, you kind of want, um, you don't want the algorithm to seem like it's being kind of more risk averse with respect to one group than to another, and more risk seeking with respect to the other group than to the one. Okay, balance for the positive or, or the negative class. Again, these are two criteria that I'm sort of talking about at the same time. Uh, balance for the positive class says that the average risk score, which was assigned to those individuals who are actually positive, should be the same for each relevant group. So take all the people who in fact went on to commit a crime, um, the average risk score of the, the black defendants who went on to commit a crime should be the same, or at least roughly the same as the average risk score, which was assigned to those white defendants who actually went on to commit a crime, right? That's balance for the positive class and balance for the negative class is just the same thing with negative instead of positive. The average risk score assigned to those individuals who are actually negative should be the same for each relevant group. This, here the motivation, uh, the, these um, two criteria are sometimes presented as generalizations to the case of risk scores of our previous criteria of equal false positive rates and equal false negative rates. So um, uh, balance for the um, positive class can be seen as a generalization of the case of risk scores of requiring equal false negative rates. And similarly, mutandis, mutandis for, for the other one. Um, so, and in fact, some of these authors explicitly, actually they use a different term for balance for the positive class or negative class, which is um, yeah, generalized, generalized false positive rate equality, that sort of thing. Okay, equal positive predictive value and equal negative predictive value. So uh, equal positive predictive value says that the percentage of individuals who are predicted to be positive, who are then actually positive, should be the same for each relevant group. And uh, again, e equal negative predictive value just says uh, the same thing, but for those who are, uh, who are predicted to be negative. So the percentage of those individuals who are predicted to be negative, who are actually negative, should be the same for each relevant group. So, you know, take um, the uh, black defendants who were predicted to uh, not commit a crime. Um, the percentage of those people who actually don't predict to commit a crime should be the same as the percentage of those white defendants who were predicted not to commit a crime who then don't commit a crime. Okay. And uh, here's a bunch of citations, but um, the idea is this, this, these uh, two criteria combined can kind of be seen as a generalization of calibration within groups to the case of binary predictions. So they require a given prediction uh, positive or negative to quote mean the same thing for each uh, of the relevant groups or ha carry the same evidentiary value let's say uh, a few others that we can go through pretty quickly um, some authors talk about equal not not equal false positive rates and equal false negative rates 
but equal ratios of the false positive rate to the false negative rate for different groups. Right? So the ratio of the false neg positive rate to the false negative rate uh, should be the same for each relevant group. A um, couple of citations, and it's sort of motivated by the thought that false positives and false negatives should um, be assigned, be, be given the same relative weights across the different groups. Okay. Equal overall error rates. So basically, that the, in, in some sense, the, the algorithm should be equally accurate for the different groups. Uh, so the number of false positives and false negatives uh, divided by the number of individuals should be the same for each relevant group. Um, this is a funny one that it's hard to see really the intuitive motivation for, but uh, it's, it's found in uh, an author who runs an impossibility theorem, uh, equal ratios of predicted positives to actual positives. So the number of individuals predicted to be positive divided by the number of individuals who are actually positive should be the same for each relevant group. And the last one, uh, this is usually called statistical parity or demographic parity. Uh, the percentage of individuals who are predicted to be positive should be the same for each relevant group which also entails that the percentage of individuals predicted to be negative should be the same for each relevant group. This is a pretty unpopular one. I, I think most of the authors who discuss it reject it, um, but I, I just throw it in there as well, just also into the hopper. Okay, cool. So here's a, just a, a quick summary in case you wanna remind yourself again. Um, we've got uh, three statistical criteria that govern risk scores. So we've got calibration within groups. That's the, that's the one I, I in a modified form, I like it. So each possible risk score, the percentage of individuals assigned that risk score who are actually positive should be the same for each relevant group and equal to that risk score. Uh, balance for the positive class, balance for the negative class. And then we've got, uh, I guess, eight st uh, statistical criteria of fairness for binary predictions. We've got equal false positive rates, equal false negative rates, equal positive predictive value, equal negative predictive value, equal ratios of the false positive rate to the false negative rate, equal overall error rates, equal ratios of predicted positives to actual positives. That's kind of hard to see the motivation behind it. And then a pretty un unattractive one, but I'll throw it in there anyway, statistical parity. Okay, again, that's a whole mouthful. Uh, don't remember, <laughs> don't worry about remembering all of those uh, details. Okay, so then there's some impossibility results. And the, this is kind of a core part of this literature on fairness in, uh, in algorithms or machine learning. So I'll mention three. Uh, I suspect there, there are kind of tons of impossibility results as, as happens in these sorts of literatures that, that involve impossibility results. Uh, so here's a really famous one from uh, John Kleinberg and co-authors. Our criteria one, two, and three, that's, uh, that's calibration within groups, balance for the positive class, and balance for the negative class. Those three criteria are not jointly satisfiable, except in the marginal cases where base rates are equal across groups. That's to say the percentage of you know, people who are actually positive is the same for each group. So the percentage of um, blacks who in fact default on a loan or would default on a loan is the same as the percentage of whites who would default on that same loan. That's what it means for base rates to be equal. So criteria, these three criteria are not jointly satisfiable unless either base rates are equal across groups or prediction is perfect. So you assign uh, risk score zero to all the actually negative people and risk score one to all the actually positive people. It's a pretty marginal case, right? Um, sort of closely related is a theorem from, I think, I think you pronounce the name um, Koldakova, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, so this says that criteria four, five, and and six are not jointly satisfiable, except in these same marginal cases. So these are um, equal positive predictive value, equal false neg negative rates, and equal false positive rates. You can't have all three of those together, except if prediction is perfect or base rates are equal across the groups. And then uh, another author, McConey, uh, has, uh, he considers the conjunction of some of these. So uh, except in the same, marginal circumstances of perfect prediction or equal base rates, uh, no algorithm can satisfy more than one of the conjunction of four and five, that's equal false positive rates and equal false negative rates. The conjunction of six and seven, that's uh, equal positive predictive value and equal negative predictive value. And 10, that's his uh, 
equal ratios of actual positives to predicted positives. So no algorithm can satisfy more than one of those, where some of these are conjunctions, except in these same marginal cases of equal base rates or perfect predictions. I'm not gonna go through the, the proofs of these um, impossibility results. They're not terribly technical, actually. Um, uh, Kleinberg has some YouTube videos where he, he sort of goes through his proof uh, in a really intuitive ways. Um, you can look at their papers. Uh, and, and then there's this uh, excellent post at the blog Phenomenal World uh, from Cosmo Grant sort of running through some of the uh, proofs. Okay, so how should we respond to impossibility? So um, here's a pessimistic response. Fairness is impossible except in marginal cases. So fairness dilemmas are all but inevitable. And a few uh, quotes here. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at my sheets because <laughs> the, uh, the thumbnails of some of your faces cover up a tiny bit of my slide. Um, so I just want to make sure I get it right. Uh, right, okay. So Kleinberg and co-authors say um, their impossibility show theorem shows that uh, any assignment of risk scores can in principle be subject to natural criticism on grounds of bias. Uh, Gabrielle Johnson, in a, uh, I've, I think it's a forthcoming paper, and it might not be in an issue, um, writes that they show that there is no such thing as an unbiased program. Uh, Sandra Mason writes that these results show that race neutrality is not attainable. Sorry. <laughs> and. Uh, in a kind of survey article that's been very influential, uh, Richard Burke and co-authors write that the implications of the impossibility results are huge. The goal of complete race or gender neutrality is unachievable. So that I think is the standard response. It, people typically just take this pessimistic response to these impossibility theorems. You know, they just show that we cannot help but be unfair or biased. But we might have a more optimistic response instead uh, we could say that the impossibility results show that not all of these criteria that I've surveyed are genuine necessary conditions on fairness. So we need to look again and see which conditions are really necessary for fairness and which are just specious uh, criteria. We could, uh, as a methodological approach, go criterion by criterion and subject each one to individual scrutiny and see uh, on what grounds you might um, want to uh, hold on to or motivate that criterion and whether some criteria are open to objections. Um, and, and I'll mention here, for instance, uh, Robert Long uh, at a, a, uh, NYU has a nice paper on uh, critiquing the, um, our criterion three, or sorry, four equal false positive rates. So he has a paper arguing that uh, fairness does not require equal false positive rates, right? So that's, that's one methodology along the lines of this optimistic response. Go criterion by criterion and subject each one to scrutiny and see whether the motivations for it stand up to scrutiny or whether there are uh, objections to it. Alternative methodology, we could find a perfectly fair algorithm and see which criteria it can violate when given the right kind of population to work on, right? And then if a criterion can be violated by an algorithm which is perfectly fair, then that shows or proves that it's not necessary for fairness, right? If you've got a perfectly fair algorithm and it can violate one of these criterion, that's a proof that that criterion is not necessary for fairness. After all, it can be violated by a fair algorithm. Okay, this methodology can seem quite impractical, um, at least when we're considering kind of real uh, algorithms like Compass or something that's been used for you know, predicting loan defaults or whatever. Um, it's always going to be controversial whether a given algorithm is fair. So it's, it might seem like, yeah, this methodology would work in theory, but in practice, it's not going to work because you'd have to come up with an algorithm that everyone agrees is perfectly fair and then see what it can violate. And uh, that seems maybe impractical, right? It's always controversial whether a given algorithm is un unfair or not. But I think we can do better. Okay, so here's my, this is the core argument of the paper, I guess. Um, I'm gonna argue that none of these statistical criteria, except for a modified version of the first one, calibration within groups, is necessary for algorithmic fairness. Uh, and that's because all of the other criteria can be violated by a predictive algorithm that is, I submit, perfectly 100% fair. 
Moreover, all of these other criteria can be violated simultaneously by my perfectly 100% fair algorithm. And moreover, they can be violated simultaneously by my perfectly 100% fair algorithm, even when base rates are equal across the groups. Okay, so here's the case, people, coins, and rooms. So there are gonna be a bunch of coins of varying biases towards heads. Each individual in our population is randomly assigned a coin. Each individual is also randomly assigned to one of two rooms, room A or room B. And our aim is to predict for each individual whether their coin lands heads or tails. That's to say whether they're a heads person or a tails person. Okay, so that's the, that's the uh, setup. Okay, lucky for us, this might seem like a hard problem, but lucky, luckily for us, each coin comes helpfully labeled with its bias towards heads. So each coin just says what its bias is. Okay, everyone clear on the, the setup? So we got a bunch of coins of varying biases, each individual randomly assigned a coin, each individual randomly assigned to one of two rooms. These are gonna be like our demographic groups. And then our predict we're trying to predict whether they're a heads person or a tails person, but luckily for us, each coin comes labeled with what its bias towards heads is. Here is my perfectly fair and uniquely optimal predictive algorithm. For each person, take their coin and read its label. If the label says X, assign that person a risk score of X. If X is greater than 0.5, make the binary prediction that the, that the individual is a heads person. If X is less than 0.5, make the binary prediction that the individual is a tails person. And for simplicity, I'm gonna assume that none of the coins are labeled 0.5, because then we would have to break the tie somehow. So that's, that's uh, my perfectly fair and uniquely optimal predictive algorithm. So this algorithm is, I think, perfectly 100% fair. Uh, its risk scores are not sensitive to the room from which a person came. The sole feature on which its risk scores and binary predictions are based is the labeled bias of, the, of each coin. And that's clearly the relevant feature to focus on. And also it's not a proxy for room membership. Okay. And not only is the algorithm not unfair to any individuals in virtue of their room membership, that's the target fairness concept that I'm working with, but there's seemingly no unfairness at all in the situation anywhere. I mean, there's a lot of arbitrariness and randomness, but there's no unfairness, I think. But crucially, what I really require is just that there's no, the algorithm is not unfair to any individuals in virtue of their room membership. Moreover, and this is just kind of bonus, the algorithm is uniquely optimal. Uh, no alternative can be expected to do as well or better at predicting heads people and tails people. Okay. Okay, first point, um, shit happens. Uh, Criteria one through 11, you might recall, I formulated those in terms of what actually happens. That's to say in terms of actual relative frequencies. This is, by the way, is the sort of more minor point here. But they, they were formulated in terms of actual percentages of you know, people who were, received some prediction who went on to recidivate. They're term, in terms of actual relative frequencies. But with coin flips, uh, as we know, anything can happen. So our FAIR algorithm can violate all of these uh, conditions, uh, even calibration within groups, given a suitable population and the vagaries of chance. So no matter what the label bias of the coin is, it could land heads or it could land tails, right? You could have all the coins heavily biased towards heads, but they all land tails or, or anything, right? Anything can happen. And a similar observation actually shows that one through 11, our criteria, they're not jointly sufficient for fairness either, right? Our unfair, an unfair algorithm could treat people differently depending on their room membership, for instance, uh, by assigning room A people with coins labeled X, uh, a risk score of X, but room B people with coins labeled X, a risk score of X squared. But you know, with the suitable assignment of coins to people and peoples to rooms, combined with the vagaries of chance, it can by luck satisfy all of our criteria. So first point is just shit happens. Uh, we shouldn't have formulated our criteria of fairness in terms of actual relative frequencies. Um, it, instead, we should reformulate them in probabilistic or expectational terms. So for example, 
uh, condition one, calibration within groups, that becomes one star, expectational calibration within groups. So this says for each possible risk score, the expected percentage of individuals assigned that risk score who are actually positive should be the same for each relevant group and equal to that risk score. Uh, equal false positive rates becomes expectational equal false positive rates. The expected percentage of negative individuals who are falsely predicted to be positive should be the same for each relevant group. So we just need to reformulate them in terms of probabilities or expectations instead of in terms of actual relative frequencies. Okay. Still, uh, even when we do that, uh, our FAIR algorithm can violate, sorry, it cannot violate one star expectational calibration within groups, but it can still violate all of the other criteria when they're reformulated in probabilistic or expectational terms. So it can violate our two star through 11 star. And indeed, it can violate them simultaneously. And indeed, it can violate them simultaneously even when base rates are equal across the groups. And we can investigate whether the starred versions of our criteria are violated by considering just a case where we stipulate that uh, relative frequencies in fact match coin biases within each room. Okay. And then if an unstarred criterion, one of our original ones is violated in such a case, so is its expectational starred analog. Here's a case. Okay, so let room A contain 12 people with coins labeled 0.75. The algorithm is going to assign all of them a risk score of 0.75, and they're going to be all predicted to be heads people. They're predicted to be positive. And in fact, because actual frequencies are being, we're going to stipulate actual frequencies match coin biases, nine of those 12 people, or three quarters, are in fact heads people. Eight people in room A also have coins labeled 0.125 or 1 eighth. They're all assigned risk score 0.125 and predicted to be tails people or negative. And in fact, one of them is a heads person. Let room B contain the following. 10 people with coins labeled 0.6. They all get assigned risk score 0.6 and they're predicted to be positive. And in fact, six of them are heads people. It also contains 10 people with coins labeled 0.4. They're all assigned risk score 0.4 and predicted to be tails people or negative. And in fact, four of them are heads people. Okay, so here's a case where we've just put, a, put in place a, a sort of sample population where in fact, uh, actual relative frequencies match coin biases. Note also in this case that base rates are equal. In each room, 10 out of the 20 people are heads people, right? So in room A, it was, uh, there are 20 people in total and uh, nine of the first group of people, those with coins heavily labeled, heavily biased towards heads, nine of them are heads. And one of the second group is, is, is heads. And in room B, you get 20 people, uh, six of the people with coins labeled 0.6 wind up being heads people and four of the people with coins labeled 0.4 are heads people for a total of 10. So in each group, 10 out of 20 people are heads people. Base rates are equal. But, and this is just uh, sort of crunching the numbers here, um, all of the other criteria are violated in this case. So I, I, you know, so I just calculated the average risk score assigned to actual heads people or actual positives. For room A, that was 0.6875. So you just take you know, um, uh, nine times 0.75 plus one times 0.125. That gives you that number. The average risk, risk score assigned to actual heads people in room B was 0.52. The average risk score assigned to actual negatives or tails people in room A was 0.3125. Uh, and for room B, that was 0.48. So we've got a violation of balance for the positive class and a violation of balance for the negative class. The false positive rate for room A was three out of 10. Right, the people were predicted to be uh, uh, positive, but were actually negative. There were three of them out of 10. Um, uh, sorry, people, yeah, um, I think I said that correctly. Uh, the false positive rate for room B was four out of 10. The false negative rate for room A was one out of 10, right? So people who were, um, uh, sorry, actually positive predicted to be negative. That was, there was just one of them out of 10 people total. Uh, for room B, that was four out of 10. The positive predictive value for room A was three-fourths, 
That's because all these people who are predicted to be positive, they all had the same risk score, which is 0.75 or three quarters. The positive predictive value for room B was three fifths. Uh, the negative predictive value for room A was seven eighths, while for room B it was three fifths. So we've got violations of equal false positive rates, violation of equal false negative rates, violation of equal positive predictive value, violation of equal negative predictive value. The ratio of the false positive rate to the false negative rate for room A was three, while for room B it was one. So we've got a violation of equal ratios of false positive rate to false negative rate. The overall error rate was different for the two groups, four out of 20 for room A and, and eight out of 20 for room B. And the ratio of positive people predicted to be positive to people who are actually positive was 12 out of 10, uh, 12 over 10 for room A and uh, 10 to 10 for room B. And uh, we violate uh, statistical parity as well because the percentage of people predicted to be positive was 12 out of 20 for room A and 10 out of 20 for room B. Okay, so um, I'm happy to put this slide up again at the, at the end, but basically I've just given you a fair algorithm that predicts people, people's, uh, whether they're heads person or tails person, by reading the labeled bias of their coin and predicting accordingly. And given the right population, like the one I've just given you, our FAIR algorithm will violate all of these statistical criteria of fairness, except for our starred version, our expectational version of calibration within groups. Okay. So this example, I think, shows that all of our criteria, except for one star, expectational calibration within groups, can be violated by a perfectly fair algorithm given a suitable background population. Uh, and that means that when one of these criteria is violated, uh, it could be due to unfairness in the algorithm, or it could be due to uh, facts about the background population to which the algorithm is applied. Now, I don't think actual populations necessarily look like my sample population, um, but until we know what a background population is really like, uh, then from a violation of any of these criteria except for expectational calibration within groups, uh, we don't know whether that violation is due to the algorithm being unfair or instead due to some fact about the background population. Okay, so that concludes my argument that among all our statistical criteria, only expectational calibration within groups is a plausible necessary condition on fairness because all the others can be violated by a perfectly fair algorithm and as a bonus, they can be violated even when base rates are equal across the groups. And I'm just gonna close really quickly. I think I should close fairly soon, uh, just with a couple, a uh, few quick topics. Uh, the first is um, that most of my, uh, most of the criteria violated by my FAIR algorithm fail for reasons related to the so-called problem of inframarginality. So at least part of fairness seems to be treating marginal cases the same across different groups. So um, for example, the least suspicious African-American person who would be uh, predicted to be carrying contraband should be exactly as suspicious as the least suspicion, suspicious white person who would be predicted to be carrying contraband. So it should treat the marginal cases the same. Or the least promising woman who would be predicted to succeed in the job should be exactly as promising as the least promising man who would be predicted to succeed, and so on. Right. But many of the criteria we've considered concern in part how things turn out with non-marginal or inframarginal uh, cases. Now, in real life, it turns out to be very controversial whether a given case is or should be considered a marginal one. Uh, but with coin flips, it's clear. The marginal cases are people with coin, coins whose labeled biases are close to 0.5, and the non-marginal or inframarginal cases are people with coins whose labeled biases are far from 0.5. And um, many of our criteria were violated because basically room A contained relatively few marginal cases. Everyone had labeled coins with labeled biases that were either you know, close, pretty close to one or pretty close to zero. Not, none with coins labeled biases who were, which were close to 0.5, whereas room B contained predominantly marginal cases. And that's why room B had a lower average score for actual positives or actual heads, a higher average score for actual negatives, actual tails, higher false positive rate, higher false negative rate, lower positive predictive value, lower negative predictive value, and a higher overall error rate 
than room A. And then I chucked in a little bit of asymmetry to get us violating all the other criteria, again, except for expectational calibration within groups. Okay, second uh, point, evidence of unfairness. So again, I've argued that none of the statistical criteria except for expectational calibration within groups is necessary for fairness. Uh, that's compatible with some of these other criteria being such that their violation still provides some prima facie evidence of unfairness. But here, uh, our original version of calibration within groups, in terms of actual relative frequencies, it has a privileged status. So each unstarred criterion, the original ones, is such that its violation would normally provide evidence that its starred analog is also violated. This is just that Relative frequencies aren't identical to probabilities, but they do provide evidence about them. But only one calibration within groups is such that its start out, start analog, its expectational version, is plausibly necessary for fairness. Um, the other criteria, two through 11 and two star through 11 star, they could still be such that their violation provides some evidence of unfairness, but this evidentiary connection is gonna be more indirect. Okay, last point, uh, multiple intervention points. So, uh, and this is, uh, yeah, kind of big picture and probably quite controversial uh, uh, take that I have that, that I wanna close with. Um, so when a predictive algorithm is used to make decisions that have distributional consequences that we regard as unfair or otherwise bad or unjust, it doesn't mean that the predictive algorithm itself was unfair or biased, right? The unfairness or bias could instead lie with the background conditions of society and or with the way decisions are made on the basis of the algorithm's predictions. And as a result, the best response in some sense uh, may not be to modify the predictive algorithm to try to force it to yield the desired distributional results, uh, but rather to either modify the way decisions are made on the basis of the predictions or to intervene in other ways to change the background conditions of society, you know, reparations, changes in the tax code, other regulations. Here's an analogy. Suppose we've got two problems, traffic and inequality. Uh, we're deciding whether to adopt a congestion pricing scheme which reduces traffic through higher fees for driving during rush hour. And one might worry, this is a natural worry to have, that this would be unfair to lower income people who have to drive further to work, they have less flexible schedules, and they wind up high, paying a higher percentage of their incomes in congestion fees. So in response, you might be tempted to kind of abandon congestion pricing or to adopt a more complex scheme where low income people are exempted. But I think there's a better response available, which is to adopt the original congestion pricing scheme along with an across the board tax cut for people with low incomes or some other intervention that just addresses your inequality. So we've got multiple goals, reducing traffic and reducing inequality, but we've also got multiple points where we can intervene. Uh, we shouldn't ask the congestion pricing scheme itself to do all the work addressing traffic and inequality at the same time. Uh, now, of course, if it's in, infeasible to adopt this more optimal divide and conquer strategy, it might be second best to adopt the more complex congestion pricing scheme that exempts low-income drivers, but that's a second best approach. Okay, similarly uh, for predictive algorithms, we've got a bunch of different goals, fair and accurate predictions, fair decisions, and a just overall society. We've got a bunch of different points where we can intervene. We can modify the predictive algorithm itself, we can modify the way decisions are made on its basis, or we can intervene elsewhere in society. And we shouldn't necessarily ask the predictive algorithm itself to achieve all of those goals on its own. Now, of course, if it's politically infeasible to adopt some fair predictive algorithm and make a bunch of interventions elsewhere, it might be second best to modify the predictive algorithm to get the distributional results we want. But it would be a mistake to think that fairness itself requires that the predictive algorithm get these results on its own. Now, of course, I think actually, in fact, there may be good practical reasons to try to get the predictive algorithm to achieve those distributional outcomes just because I think it's, um, you know, it's different parties doing the algorithm design as who have authority over taxes and reparations and so forth. And you might think it's, it seems unlikely that Congress is actually gonna enact more sweeping changes that we need. Um, but I do think it's a hard empirical matter to figure out how predictive algorithms should be designed in light of this 
anticipated failure on the part of others to make more drastic uh, steps to address these inequalities. Um, I don't think it'll be something that we can capture through some simple statistical measure. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, I think I've presented a case where that shows that fairness doesn't require any of these statistical criteria except for one, expectational calibration uh, within groups because a perfectly fair algorithm can violate all of the others. Okay, thank you. And here are some references.